You Booked It, episode 137. What's going on, everyone? Thank you for joining me today on You Booked It, the number one podcast where you learn how to create a successful entertainment career. Every episode is a masterclass on how to move your career forward. And if you want even more, head over to YouBookedItPodcast.com and join the email community where we dig deep into what you can be doing right now to help book that next gig. And now, let's do this. Okay, let's get started. I am excited to introduce my guest today, Stephanie Clemens. Are you ready for this, Stephanie? I hope so. <laughs> All right. Stephanie is an award-winning performer, choreographer, and director who has worked on the pre-Broadway and Broadway productions of Hamilton, In the Heights, Bring It On, and If Then. She sang on the original cast albums of three out of four of those shows and got to perform in the now infamous Tony performance with Hamilton as they performed Yorktown Sans Guns as a statement against gun violence. Her body of work can be seen currently on Broadway and around the world as the associate and supervising choreographer of the smash hit Hamilton. Commercially, she has choreographed content for Victoria's Secret, Vogue, Sesame Street, the new Netflix series The Hunt, and was the choreographer behind the viral Time of Our Lives Super Bowl commercial featuring Eli Manning and Odell Beckham. Activism and philanthropy is hugely important to Stephanie. She recently became a certified 200-hour yoga instructor, and she donates 50% of all of her profits from her yoga classes to charity. Of all that she's done, though, Stephanie is most proud of her nonprofit she started 10 years ago, which connects kids facing life-threatening and terminal illness with artists to collaborate on art, dance, and music projects. And she's always looking for more ways to give back. Stephanie, that is a quick intro of who you are and what you've done, but why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself, fill in the gaps, and a little bit more about what you do as a professional in the entertainment industry. Oh my gosh, I don't even, that was such a thorough reading of me. Let's see, <laughs> I was born in New Jersey. <laughs> I really like egg salad. No, let's see, fill in the gaps. So I am, I was really born in New Jersey. That's a true fact. I went to Rutgers University for college. I double majored in genetics and microbio research and modern dance, but I actually really just wanted to be on Broadway. So I moved to New York by way of the Lincoln Tunnel. And I am happy to say that I booked the show in the Heights about a year and a half into my time in New York. Prior to that, I did the first national tour of Bombay Dreams, which was my equity card experience. That's where I got my equity card. And cool. yeah, and prior to that, I did a bunch of off-Broadway shows. I backup danced for Don Omar and at Madison Square Garden. I did a commercial with Sierra. I did lots of cool stuff in between all the beautiful, brilliant things that you've read, but I'm sure we'll get into a bunch of those things as we continue talking. Great. And let's get into this first section here. And Stephanie, look, I am a sucker for a good quote. What is your favorite quote you'd like to share with everyone? Ah, oh, wow. My favorite quote. There's so many good ones. It's funny. So I, you mentioned in the intro that I just went to through yoga school and while I was studying on zoom, what I would do is if my teacher said something really amazing and brilliant, I would just write it down and just quote them. Mm. So I created this whole beautiful quote wall. And one of the quotes that I used today in a yoga class that I taught was, if you force the body, it pushes back. And I've been thinking a lot lately about force and how as a society here in the US, a lot of things feel forceful. There's a lot of rules and regulations that require people to fit in certain boxes and how sometimes if you just allow yourself to do a little bit more list listening, sometimes the action will happen on its own in an organic way. So you get the same result, but without that word force. And so I've been thinking a lot about that quote lately. Yeah, I really like that quote and that you brought that up right now, because when you think about just the pure physical nature of that quote, when it was said with yoga or with performance or with dance or what it might be, yeah, that makes sense. It's very applicable and very direct. But I love that you expanded it further into the metaphor and how it impacts all of our lives as a community. And it's so true. And I think we all need to take a moment to just 
breathe, relax, and look at everything the way it is and see what we can do about it? Is there an efficient way to do this instead of trying to just push our way through everything? Yeah. And I have, I should say that the quote was said by uh, my teacher, whose name was Kenny Frisbee. And I have a toddler and he's 17 months old. And I'll tell you, if there's any human that's going to teach you about forcing and not forcing and how you really can't force things, sometimes it's a toddler. <laughs> and, um, you know, sometimes I realize like when I want him to do something and I just, I want him to do it right now. I want to force him to do it. And my wife is so excellent at just like getting down to his level, literally like crouching down and just being like, Hey, we're going to do this. And then we're going to do this. And then you're going to get that thing. Okay. And he's like, yeah. And I just am always so impressed because it's like, she got the same result, but without a lot of the tears. And, and it's, if we would just put in a little bit of effort and do a little bit more listening to our, like, it starts with you, right? So it starts with your body. And as a dancer and choreographer, that's something that I hope to really expand into my work and having your dancers not forced, not forcing your dancers to do things, but helping them develop and discover the thing that you want them to do without force, but it makes it more of a collaboration. And ultimately, when you make people the source of their own creation, so when you allow people to source and be a part of um, the creative process, it one is beneficial to you because ultimately a, they remember the thing they created, right? So it's not just memorizing someone else's word or movement. And two, it allows them to really take ownership and it shows in the performance and it shows in the way the integrity of the piece as it's being carried out. Yeah. Making it part of a collaboration. I love that. And I can absolutely relate to your toddler. We have a three and a half, almost, well, she's nearly four, I should say, but whew, there are those moments. And you're absolutely, my <laughs> wife is much better at communicating that. And I'm getting better at it. But it's challenging when you're in the moment, isn't it? Yeah. Jeez. All right, let's move on to this next section here. And Stephanie, of course, you are an entertainer. I'm an entertainer. And I think that you'd agree that this industry can be one of the most subjective, brutally honest, personally emotional industries in existence. And you know, as well as I, that in order to create and have a successful career in this industry, like you're having now, takes a lot of dedication and hard work. And while, yeah, There's an outrageous amount of fun and excitement being an entertainer, doing what we do. There are also our fair share of obstacles, challenges, failures that we are going to experience and we're going to have to move forward through. So tell us, what is one key challenge, obstacle, or failure you've experienced in your career? And how did you come out the other side better because of it? Yeah, I used to tell this story a lot and I have gotten away from it, but this question points to it so directly. When I was very early on in my career, prior to booking that Bombay Dreams, I was probably just 21, graduated college and in Manhattan, pounding the pavement. And I had uh, a series of auditions for Oklahoma and the casting director, I'll never forget. I don't believe she's casting anymore, but she was cool, cute, little, awesome woman. And she came up to me at the end of a callback and she had been there like three times. And every time I got called back and she was like, Stephanie, listen, you're not ethnic enough to be the token black girl. I'm not black, so that wouldn't have worked. And she said, but you're (laughs) just not white enough to be in the show. I was like, wow like it had never i'm just i'm a jewish girl from new jersey and right you know my whole life people always assumed i was puerto rican and so i was and like that would i was used to being told that i was maybe not quote unquote like your average white girl but to sort of have it said like that to sort of understand ultimately that the world around us moves about because it's able to quickly categorize things and that I had never seen myself in this way. And this woman was holding a mirror up to me. And I suddenly was like, oh, I guess I'm, I guess I'm just not white. And I also know that I'm not South Asian or African American or any of these other, at the time, ethnicities that were really being like tokenized and exoticized. And so I had to find a way to break into the industry. And I had an agent who I repeated that feedback and the agent said to me, Bombay Dreams is having an audition. Why don't you go in for that? I was like, Bombay Dreams? Like I'm not South Asian. I'm, I'm, I'm not from India. Like I'm not even remotely. It just didn't, it just would have yeah, never occurred yeah, to yeah. me. Anyway, I went to the audition 
and I booked the show. And I know that was in 2006, maybe. So uh, that's 14 years ago. And obviously times have changed now. And there's a lot of call for not appropriating and not misappropriating culture. And I don't know that would have happened now. I don't know that I would have booked that show. But at the time, being in a room with all of those people who maybe looked different, people who always say to me, I don't like, what are you, Stephanie? What are you? Like, they just <laughs> yeah. didn't. And I would always say Jewish. And they were like, what? Like, that's not a nationality. And, you know, like people just didn't understand the Jewish diaspora through time. And so that's just was not ever an answer that made anybody shut up, which just like, constantly had that question. And to be in a room with all of those people and, and the cast of Bombay Dreams, and it was a mixture of people. There was like Hawaiian Americans. There were, of course, South Asians, fa- 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 people that were from India and people that were African American. We kind of all like got thrown in there and it was really nice. It was really lovely to just be with a group of people that was all different ethnicities and to share in the richness of the stories that everybody had. It was like the first time I felt like I belonged. And then I went on from that show to book In the Heights. I guess I then felt the freedom to audition for things that were quote unquote non-white. Obviously, I think now this whole conversation beginning with what the casting director said to me would probably not be a, converse, a PC conversation that people would have nowadays. But right. um, but I feel like that was a difficulty only because when she first said that to me, I just, I was taken aback. I was like, mm. what does it matter what I look like? Like, you're telling me I'm, I'm talented. I'm dancing well. I'm singing well. And you're telling me I don't, I won't look right in the show. And I'm glad that we've broken down a lot of those barriers. I've obviously have been a part of a number of shows that have helped that. But also it's in support of the idea that we are more than what we look like, that there are stories that are capable of and worth being told. And while, of course, it's a survival mechanism for humans to categorize, right? That's how we quickly shuffle through information. I recognize the importance of that innate quality that we have. It's knowing that we're sentient and conscious beings. It's important to move past that and to maybe look a little bit deeper. And I hope now that's a time that we're going through. We're moving through that level of consciousness. That is such a good story and your challenges and your journey through that. But so great that you found your path and you've been able to be part of, like you said, so many wonderful productions that have really broken down any of those kinds of barriers. And we're moving forward. Things are things have a ways to go, sure, but it's got a spotlight on it now. And we're able to move in the right direction, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. And Let's move on to a time that I like to call your spotlight moment. That (laughs) one moment in time you realized, yes, I am going to be an entertainer for a living. Or maybe it was, yes, this is what I need to be doing as an entertainer. Tell us about that. Oh, I have to say, I have sometimes my memory is a bit odd, but not odd, but sometimes my memory is like foggy. I don't have like super clear memory, but I will say that I remember the very first time I was in like um, a talent show in school and I was so terrified and I had the biggest butterflies and stage fright, but I was performing a dance to Madonna. I can't remember what song right now. I, I feel like if I called my mom, she'd know. But so I was performing to Madonna and I had so, I was so much fear and I was preparing for it and everything. And then I got on the stage and I did it. And just the feeling that came over me as I began to perform and I began to take on this alter maybe not I was super shy as a kid and so being able to be on stage and be open and outward and emotive um, and connect with people ultimately because I didn't really know how to do that verbally and like through the not super outgoing and just connecting with people for the first time and like that and then of course when you're done and the music stops and everybody applauds and just my gosh you're such a great dancer and hearing all those <laughs> yeah. things that people say can I was they're addictive and I was like my gosh I want to do this for the rest of my life oh that's so good I can kind of relate I started performing in a bit later in life, mid high school, really. And I remember doing a talent show and I was a backup dancer for one of my friends and she was doing a Britney Spears song, (laughs) you know, and 
it was this it was one of my first main or big experiences in front of a crowd and nervous don't even hardly remember doing the actual number there's no time for that i was just so laser right. focused on just not screwing up but you're right that is such a great feeling and your story just reminded me of that i haven't thought about that for so <laughs> long yeah <laughs> <laughs> thanks for that i mean oh. it's so formative especially when you're a child when you're younger it's that experience really makes a mark on your psyche and then you're just like <laughs> you're then stuck on just these oh gosh I, ha I have to make that happen I want to do that yeah for sure and I want to piggyback on that real quick and talk about your number one booked it moment walk us through that day the audition and callbacks if they happen to be a part of it what was going on in your life and what about that moment makes it your favorite booked it moment yeah, I think my favorite booked it moment is the call from Bethany Knox at Telsey and Co. when I booked in the Heights. So mm. I had, like I said, been in Bombay Dreams. It was a 10 month tour and we were in our final city, Seattle. And I decided to, as a few, like two months back, um, Jeremy Liner, one of my tour mates, who I think is now like an agent or something, we were sitting on a bus. We were busing it from. Houston to Dallas. It was like one of our only bus cities. So we all had prepped all of our like activities. And he had this yep. song on his playing on, I don't even know if we had playing on the phones at that time. I can't remember when <laughs> so long ago. I don't know if we played <laughs> songs on our phone or how we, how did we play songs? iPods? I don't know. Um, he was playing a song on a music playing device, whatever that was 15 years ago. And right. he was like, you have to hear this. It's, you know, my roommate in New York, he's an intern at a literary agency and they have this guy and he's writing a musical and it's going to be amazing. Listen to this music. And I heard Chris Jackson um, sing Benny's Dispatch. And I was like, this is it. Like, this is the musical that was made for me. This is what I've been waiting for. I was like a child of the rent era. And, you know, all I ever wanted to do was be in rent and rent is amazing. And I love Michael Greif and everyone that created it, but it's not um, like a super heavy dance show. Like the dancing in right. it is beautiful and iconic, but it's not like for a dancer, um, super heavy. And I just heard the music and I just saw dancers all over the stage doing like movement that felt authentic to me and the movement that I grew up doing at home and, and in my neighborhood. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have to be in this musical. And so we were flying to our fast forward. That was July, fast forward to September. It was actually September 11th, 2000, I think in six or something. And I was supposed to be flying home flying back on tour. And so what I did was I sent my luggages on my flight at 9am and I did a same day standby. And I went back into the city from LaGuardia and I did the open call and I went to the men's call Whoa. because I couldn't stay for the female call. Yeah. So I went to the 10am. I like got my luggage on the plane at 7am. I went to the 10am call. Andy Blankenbuehler was like, all right, it was me and this other girl over there. He's like, all right, you guys are fierce. You're coming to the call back next week, but you have to bring heels because you're dancing with the guys today, but next week you're going to be with the girls. And I was like, oh my God, he said I'm coming back next week. What am I going to do? I'm going to be in Seattle. So I get the official yeah. phone call and the phone call comes in. This is a way longer story than you asked for. This is not the last day I'm telling no, you the it's story. Good, so it's good. You Keep going. Cut all this out. <laughs> so um, so next week I fly back. We have eight show. We have five show weekends because it's your typical sort of like experimental tour contract we go I'm like okay I gotta buy a red eye ticket so I like asked my mom do you think I should buy this you think it's worth it I just started saving up money and she's like Stephanie do you I was like I know I can book the show she's like you gotta buy it so I buy my red eye I go back the next you know morning and we're having a dance call back and it was one of the best experiences of my life I won't go into it because uh, this story this could take the full hour but it was like <laughs> Offer Hines was there and Nina Lafarga was there and all these iconic dancers that I just now know and love and Andy if you learn like Lin-Manuel Miranda and Bill Sherman and Alex Sakamar and Tommy Kale are sitting at the front of the room and they're watching us all go through the dances and we did five different dances and it was unbelievable day so anyway I, I get on the plane that evening I go back to where I do my eight shows sure enough Friday comes around I get a call from you know casting like we're gonna have you back in on Monday for a singing call back and I was like oh my god so I my friend Joseph Whoa. Morales on tour I was like okay Joseph I gotta learn all these songs and he, he and I go into the backspace in the theater where we were performing in Seattle and he like rehearses all the songs with me and, and I get on the plane and I get off the plane at 740 and my calls at 1140. And you know, when, when you take a red eye, like 11 a.m. rolls around and you and from like the West Coast going that you're just like yeah. shot. So yes. I go into yes. the call and I like my voice cracks and Bethany, who knows me from like having a million rent callbacks. She's like, girl, I know you can do better than she got to pull through. And I was like, if you let me back in the they kind of like, thank you. OK. And I walked out and she like came out in the hallway and got me. And she's like, I need you to pull through. So I came in. I sang everything I know. Mandy Gonzalez 
like iconic song. And I think maybe Tommy Kale might have shed a tear. I don't know. I don't remember. But it was pretty <laughs> emotional because I was pretty, yeah. I was like really meant it. And uh, anyway, very long story long. Here's my booked it story finally. So I go back on tour. It's our final week. I fly home. The tour is done. I'm in New York. I get a call. One final callback. Okay. In the callback is like the Carla Garcia and, and Rosie Lonnie Fieldman and just like epic people. They're looking for only two spots. And so Andy teaches us all the numbers that we did before. And he's like, I'm going to do one new number that we just choreographed this week at the dance workshop. And he teaches us the opening number. And I've told this story a thousand times, so I won't go into the story. And if anybody wants to know the story, they can listen to other podcasts. But basically what happened next is something that I don't really tell. I left and Rosie Fiedelman and I found each other in the hallway. And I was like, was that magical for you? She's like, it was magical. She's like, I really hope that we get this because something special happened in that room. I was like, I agree. And so I leave and I'm like, just like thinking about this. And I can't even just say, I was like, but if nothing comes of this, that was a magical callback. And I've had four incredible weeks and I, freaking made it through three red eyes and the end of a tour and eight shows a week all these oh. things and i'm walking down the stairs of what used to be mars 2112 which is now an equinox at the bottom of the uh, at the top of the red one train which used to be the one nine at 51st street and i'm walking down those stairs and just before i enter the subway my phone rings and i like i'm like oh my god this is bethany knox like i, I know this number and i i walk back to the stairs and she's are you sitting down i was like Oh my God. So I sit down on the stairs <laughs> at 51st street and seven and Broadway. And she's like, Stephanie, it was all worth it. You booked in the Heights. And I was like, Oh, oh my God, I can't believe it. And I, I had said, I was like, I would sweep the floors at the theater if they would just let me be a part of that show. It's going to be so special. And obviously it ultimately led to me making my Broadway debut. And that was definitely like the most epic booked it phone call I ever got. <laughs> Oh my, that is such a good story. Three red eyes, four weeks. Oh, that's yeah. <laughs> crazy. While being on tour, you've got to be kidding me. That is insane. I love that story. So good. Thank you for it's sharing amazing. that. Yeah, of all yeah. the cities we could be to for coming from Seattle to New York, it was just like, yeah, right. just we couldn't have to get go as far as possible. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So good. And let's take a moment to talk about the present. What projects are you working on now? And what are you looking forward to? And it's a crazy time, right? Where amidst this global pandemic, how do you see the entertainment industry moving forward in the next couple of years? Yeah, well, I hope we've learned a lot about accessibility. And it's funny because you know, I was just teaching a masterclass just before this tonight. And I was saying to the kids, like, so one of the kids asked me, what's the biggest thing you've learned during this pandemic about our industry? And I was like, what a crazy portion of the world and market we were missing prior to the pandemic. Because Zoom existed before, Google Hangouts existed before, all of these means of connecting people existed. And yet we were never offering Broadway Dance Center classes to people in Brazil. We were never offering that any performer could be a part of a reading, even if they weren't located in New York, because Zoom auditions could happen and, and a Zoom reading of a new musical could happen. And I just feel like we were missing out on A, so much access and two and B, so much accessibility, like literally giving people opportunity that to take dance class or to see musicals like Hamilton on Disney Plus, like Hamilton was supposed to come out in theaters in a few years from now for yeah. who knows how much theater prices, ticket prices would be uh, movie theaters, right? Like yeah. I know in, in New York, a movie ticket is something like $18 or something. And that's not family of four, five, six. That's not you, super um, accessible. And yet yeah. now you can rent Disney Plus for a month at six ninety nine, and you can watch Hamilton. And so I hope that we maintain that level of access. I hope that we continue to innovate in that way. And personally, as far as what I'm working on, I'm working on creating a new musical. It's moving pretty slowly because I do watch, speaking of pandemic, there's not really very many child care options. So I watch yeah. my my one year, my one and a half year old. And so my progress is slow, but steady learning to breathe into that. And I am doing a lot of work with my nonprofit with Katie's art project, where I connect kids facing life threatening illnesses with artists. And we 
create original music. And we have been doing a lot of quarantine programming. Again, things that we didn't think to do before to have people create dances or sing songs or give, you know, we, we had like a Lion King sing along with Ronald McDonald House a few weeks ago, which was so special and so cool. And we just had never thought to do that. And just to be able to bring these cast members figuratively and virtually into the house, into the Ronald McDonald House and, and spend time with both fans and kids is so amazing. And I'm just really grateful that maybe our eyes have been opened. And I don't think we're ever going back to the old world where, you know, the only way to take a dance class in New York City is to show up in person. And I'm excited about that. Yeah, the accessibility part that you brought up is, it's so true. And I really hope that it does stay around. And the virtual, you're so right, all of those platforms did exist. And it was an inevitability that things would have eventually gone digital more so on this level, but we've just right. been thrown into it. It's expedited it so much. And I think it's for the better. Sure, we're still ironing things out, sure, but we're there. And so much is able to be created and the collaborations that are being made, it's amazing. Yeah, 100%. And I feel like allowing more people to access musicals, art, dance, you name it, is going to just create better art in the end because it's going to bring more voices forth and maybe touch people that would not have otherwise been um, in contact with it. For sure. Because like you said, you brought up the cost of a movie ticket in New York. It's expensive. It's a big night out for something that's casual. And I remember when I was in university, I studied for a semester in Vienna, Austria, you know, studying music. And we got to go to the opera or we can go to anything, the opera, the ballet, whatever. But it was the best stuff in the world, the best opera stars in the entire world. And I wasn't the biggest fan of opera, but I became one. And we could go there for a euro fifty for standing room tickets. Sure, you had to stand in line a little bit, but I love that it was so accessible. And I'm so glad that now in America, it's becoming, or the world really, some of the highest caliber art and shows that we can find and experience are becoming accessible to everybody for very little money. Yeah. And imagine the community of people that's not able to a go to college or b study abroad and experience exactly those right. things you know like that's exactly the accessibility is tenfold for them if those things are available virtually absolutely and let's move on to one of my favorite sections in the interview i call it the grease lightning round I am going to ask you a handful of questions. I want you to answer them as quickly and concisely as possible, one after another. Are you ready? Never been readier. All right. First question. What was the one thing holding you back from committing to a career as an entertainer? I really loved the idea of being a doctor and helping people in that way. And I was torn between the two for a long time. Ah, same here. I thought I was going to be an ER doc. <laughs> and then didn't do that clearly. <laughs> and the second question, what is the best piece of advice you have ever received? Don't listen to pe people's advice because nobody's path is your own. There we go. Third question, what is something that is working for you right now? Or if you'd like to go pre-COVID, what was working for you before our industry went on pause? What's working for me is my Weedod hair products. I really like them and they're really reliable. And the fourth question, what is your best resource, whether that is a book, a movie, a YouTube video, maybe a podcast or piece of technology that you found is helping your career right now? Honestly, Instagram hashtags, because you can find so much using hashtags. You can hashtag types of choreography. You can hashtag different types of dance styles. You can hashtag different w help that you need specifically and in the hashtags you can look at so much content and to me it's the fastest way to access the most content for our industry oh that is that is such a good resource because i think a lot of us will use instagram just to passively scroll through and take in content but to be really purposeful and be searching it using it as its own kind of mini google yeah, is exactly. amazing exactly so cool. And the fifth question, if you had to start your career from scratch, but you still had all the knowledge and experience you've collected from your career in this industry, what would you do or not do? Would you do anything differently or would you keep it the same? 
Oh my God, that's such a good question. I'd be so tired because I know how much work it takes to get here. (laughs) (laughs) So I'd start by taking a nap. No, I'm kidding. I would definitely say to myself, don't judge what you think you can't do. Just go out there and do the thing because other people are going to do plenty of telling you what you can and can't do. But you have to put yourself out there because I found that for me, I limited so many opportunities for myself just because I was like, oh, I don't really think I'm good enough for that. But then I'm here and I'm looking at what people do. And I'm like, I I absolutely belonged in that room. And I just didn't think I did. And uh, so I would tell myself to just go for it, to go for all of it. It's hard enough to be judged constantly by yourself and just let that go. Do the thing and let the world sort of ping pong you around because it's going to do that anyway. That is so good and so insightful. You know, I love it when guests like you, people like you come on the show and they say something that important, that pertinent, because it makes me go, oh, yes, this is why this podcast matters for our industry. Thank you so much for that. Absolutely. Yeah. And the last question, what is the golden nugget knowledge drop you've learned from your successful career you'd like to leave with everyone? The golden nugget is that sometimes you're going to knock on a door and you're going to knock on it incessantly because people have told you that persistence is important and it is. And it's also true that sometimes your hand gets tired and your head gets tired from banging. And it's also worthy and noble to stop banging on that door and look for a door that is open. And I feel like because as a youth, one of the things that we say constantly is like, you can achieve anything. And if you want your dreams, go for it. And that's true. That is true. I'm not taking it anything away from that. But there's also an, a worthy path that looks like a lot of right turns and left turns. And for some reason, we value people that say they're going to do something and then they do exactly that and more. Oh, see, you reached your dreams, but I just did blah, 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 fill in the blank as if it's not worthy, as if that's not like a worthy life. And I just don't feel like that's true. I feel like there's a lot of ways to make a worthy life, both in the arts and in any other industry. And I think that deserves to be valued because people deserve to be valued no matter what their choices are. Oh, again, thank you for that. So good. Everyone, please rewind that. Listen to that once or twice more. That was so good. Thank you, Stephanie. And to wrap up this interview, It is time to give yourself a plug. Stephanie, where can we find you? How do our listeners connect with you? Is there anything you want to promote? You can find me on Instagram at danceism, dance ism. And my Twitter handle is not that because there's apparently a European DJ with that handle. So on Twitter, I'm at Steph underscore Clem. And of course, I have to plug my nonprofit, Katie's Art Project, because we're always looking for people, content, donations, everything to keep this really incredible cause going. And that's www.katiesartproject.org. We're also available on all the socials at Katie's Art Project. Fantastic. And for everyone listening out there, I have put the links to everything Stephanie just said into the description of this episode. And to easily check out her nonprofit, go to youbookeditpodcast.com forward slash Stephanie. And that's with an I E at the end. And also, be sure that you share this podcast with your fellow entertainers, coaches, teachers, and anyone who you know is aspiring to create a career in this industry. It is an integral part of helping them succeed because You Booked It has become the number one largest resource of expertise on this subject. And if you enjoy this episode, please hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining me today. It has been an absolute honor and a privilege to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It was wonderful. The questions were great. It was lovely to go back down memory lane with all that stuff, Dane. Thank you so much for joining us today. Don't miss an episode. I have a new guest seven days a week. Every guest drops more value and insight than any other resource out there. So make sure you hit that subscribe button. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd love to hear from you leave us a rating and review. Also, 
be sure to head over to youbookedpodcast.com and join our free email community where we dig deep into a continually growing resource of truly actionable things you can be doing right now to help you advance your entertainment career. All the best to you. We'll see you tomorrow.